We are so happy to kick off our Master Your Mind Fireside Chat series. I've got Phoenix right there ready to jump in if ever something needs addressing by the one and only. We've got Dr. Leila Ben Youssef right next to Phoenix's tile. Well, from my side, it's Phoenix and then Dr. Leila Ben Youssef right next to him. So anyway, this is a fireside chat. So I purposely did not want this to sound like a Q&A of back and forth. We're going to chat as if Leila is sitting on my sofa having a, I forget what your choice of drink is, Dr. Ben Youssef, or do you drink at all anymore? I mean, it used to be bourbon on the rocks, but right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Congratulations, Dr. Ben Youssef. I feel odd calling you Dr. Ben Youssef. Layla, yeah. <laughs> Layla is expecting her second child. Yay. Oh my God! So that's congratulations. Awesome. Yes, yes. So, I don't know how this mad talented woman is handling all of this but that's what we're going to dive into today the master your mind beyond the physical because <laughs> everything she does is just to me incredible i was reading the bio and years ago i wrote an article about you when i still had my track club do you remember yes and i was exhausted typing up <laughs> all her accomplishments. I wanted to take a nap. <laughs> but anyway, so we're going to kick this off. But first, thank you to Phoenix for allowing this, this channel, this forum. You're tireless in getting us together. Unbelievable. Next time, you should be the one doing the, the mastering the mind thing. Oh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to jump in. Are we going to save time for questions towards the end, Phoenix? Um, if you'd like to, sure, why not? Okay, because some of you might have comments and observations that you want to share and questions that'd be fantastic and very welcome. So as I said, Dr. Leila Ben Youssef, Olympian, volunteer track and field coach. By the way, this is ongoing. This is not like in her past. <laughs> Olympian, volunteer track and field coach, emergency medicine physician at, I believe, Highland. Is that correct? Right in my training. So I'm at Kaiser. I'm in Oakland now. Oh, nice. You're in Oakland. So never a dull moment. And you are a Fogarty Global Fellow. We will touch on that later. That's what took you to Kenya for more amazing work. World traveler. So many countries visited. Used to be. Used to be, well, <laughs> used to be for all, all of us. Of us. <laughs> <laughs> Boo -hoo. And at one point, I remember this about you. You were a volunteer at a NICU preemie infant cuddling thing. I don't even know how to say that. How do you say that? You were a cuddler for preemie babies. 80 year old volunteers. But yeah, I got to cuddle preemie, premature infants. So it? cool. Oh my goodness. Layla is married to another physician, wonderful person, Brad, and has a one-year-old daughter, Naya, and the second one coming very, not very soon. When is that? Not very soon, uh, in January. So All right. So diving into it, yeah. I mentioned Olympian. Tell us about the story of how your athletic career started because there's a wonderful story that i remember where you saw something as you were doing multiple sports you saw something in high school that made you very interested it's not a sport it's not an event in track and field that's easy to learn nor is it the most safe so <laughs> tell us about that moment if you take us back to you were what running around the track you were yeah. kicking a soccer ball. What was it? A little bit of backstory. I think I mentioned it maybe in the bio, but um, I'm the daughter of immigrants. I grew up in really rural Montana, a uh, town of 4,000. The next town over that was bigger was about a five hour drive away. Um, so everyone did all the sports for after school activities that one would do. And so I was doing track at the time and I was doing all the events and I saw the guys doing this thing, which I would learn would be pole vaulting. Um, and I had no idea what it was. But I was like, I don't know what that is. I want to do that next. And the coach turned to me and he's like, I'm sorry, girls, don't do that. You're too weak. And I was like, huh. 
all right, so I've been beating the guys in you know, PE for my entire life, if you can handle it. But they didn't quite see it that way. So I kept bothering them, and it ended up that I was one of the first generation of women pole vaulters. So 2000 was the first Olympic year for women pole vaulting. Um, before that had been exclusively a men's sport, similar to the marathon, where women were thought to be too weak or incapable of doing it. Um, and we started to lose all of our dual meets because they had girl pole vaultings and Montana being progressive as it is, was the first state to allow really girls pole vaulting. So the last meet, they handed me a pole that had been broken unbeknownst to me. And I just went over and I used it and then I ended up winning. I did not win at any big height, mind you, at all. But starting that day, I was kind of hooked and I suddenly got a little bit more support from the coaching staff. And then a couple months later, I won nationals and it just kind of went from there. So that's my little pole vaulting intro. It is an incredibly challenging sport, as Ro mentioned, um, and does have with it inherent danger like many other sports. But this one is because you fall from a big height. So it's the sport, for those of you who aren't familiar, where you run with a long stick, you jump in the air, you go over a bar, um, usually about 15 to 16 feet, um, and then land on a pad. So I started off that way and then was recruited to Stanford um, from high school. Um, and by the way, I did beat the boys by the end of high school. Just <laughs> yes, yes. So when you said, oh, you have a stick, you jump over a pole, th there are many other things that go into pole vaulting. You made it sound as if you were just going to catapult yourself over <laughs> the bar, but it's you true. actually It'll also go upside down while you're in the air. <laughs> the most technical sport there is, if you guys think of a gymnastics, if you've seen gymnastics, similar to the vault, where you run down, you sprint like a sprinter, you jump off the ground like a long jumper, you invert like a gymnast and you push off the ground using kind of just your, or your push off the pole using your um, upper body. You are supposed to be ideally 5'10 to 6 foot tall. You can't tell, I'm almost 5'2". I am not what a pole vaulter should be traditionally look like. Um, and when I got to the Olympics, I was like, all right, I'm eight inches shorter than everyone else. Cool. <laughs> Work out well. um, and I think because of my height, I faced a lot, a few more challenges. One, technically and physically, like I'm not supposed to jump this high. Um, and two, the expectation was I was never going to jump that, just based on what it looked like. But when they first started pole vaulting a sport, what they did is recruited ex gymnast because they were comfortable getting upside down, and I looked like one. By the time I retired, though, they started getting gymnasts that were you know, in like 10 years old that had outgrown it and were going to be six feet tall. So. Well, how did you convince the coach to let you try? I mean, I know you said you kept coming back. You, you kept bugging them. Honestly, just what? kept bothering him about it over and over and over again and convincing him. At one point, they did say that if I went upside down, my uterus was going to turn upside down. And I was like, again, <laughs> I'm 15, but I'm pretty sure that's not how this works. <laughs> So fast forward then after you won so many meets and you were champion, then Stanford comes along. Were you looking at other places apart from Stanford or was that the goal was to get to Stanford? I did um, to many different places um, and received many offers for scholarships to other places. Um, what was challenging was again that I was an immigrant child because my parents knew nothing. And coming from rural Montana, no one had been recruited to the level that I had been before. So I, I honestly was going about it blindly, was it, which was challenging. And I, we definitely got taken advantage of during the process. Um, Stanford popped up because I had a giant book before we had the internet. And I went through the pages and I was like, which one's a good school? And then um, I, wanted to know, I wanted to know which one where I could be a good, good academically and good um, athletically. And there are very few programs that have the mix of both of those. So early on, I knew I wanted to be a physician. I got sidetracked. I did many, many adventures, which were fantastic. Um, but those were kind of my priorities going into it. And then I just kind of started, I started cold calling people initially, because again, another reason people didn't know, they saw me, my name on the top of the list, but they would see that I was from rural Eastern Montana and think there's no way we are going to get one of these people to come here. Um, so I started cold calling and that's how I ended up at Stanford. So right there, by you cold calling without the support of your parents' know-how as far as getting you to Stanford, what was it about 
just the fact that, oh, you are not looking at me specifically, so I'm going to make you look at me. What was burning in your gut that you kept thinking, you have to answer my call? I wanted to train and I wanted to train in a good institution. And Stanford was the best of the best at the time. And I felt that I could be competitive at that level. Um, fast forward and I was not very competitive at that level. But um, at the time, that was kind of my dream. Um, and then when my dad, my dad had the initiative to take me to go look at schools. Um, and so we went and looked at schools. And funnily enough, we went across the West Coast and I went to Berkeley and it was, those of you who don't know, so Berkeley and Stanford are rivals and they're only about 15 miles apart, but they're worlds apart. Um, Berkeley, when we got to Berkeley, we got a flat tire, a homeless person chased us. Um, <laughs> we got a parking ticket. It was raining and dark and miserable. And then, and, you know, three hours later, we drove to Stanford and I went to Palm Drive where there are palm trees everywhere and it was sunny and beautiful. And I was like, this one, I was like this one. Um, and in retrospect, it was good for me then because it was a safe and easier transition. Um, my brother ended up going to Cal. Like I think Cal is a remarkable school, but coming from the very small town that I did come from and I needed the academic support that I would get at Stanford in a much smaller community. So you get to Stanford and you are immediately in the varsity team, right? You didn't need to try out. You're already there. So what was that like? You coming from, as you said, rural Montana, and then you go to Stanford, which we know is a wealthy school. So now you've got teammates that have had so many experiences as far as amazing coaches in high school, uh, extra coaches during the summer. Tell us what it was like for you being, and as you said yourself, physically, people are looking at you like, uh, you are going to pole vault? You? Yeah, I mean, it was different. It was, I mean, obviously the pole vaulters I knew from being on the like national circuit at the time. Um, and so that was comfortable. And those, those, those pole vaulters remain still to this day my closest friends. The friends that you cry with, the friends that you celebrate with, the, you know, you're with them six hours a day. Um, they're still my closest camaraderies. Um, but it was a challenge. I had never, I had done three to four sports every year. Because again, in Montana, you do everything. Like everyone has to do everything because there's not enough people to do it as opposed to in California, where if you don't start a sport when you're four years old, you're never going to make it, you know, it's like just a very different lifestyle. Um, so I think the hardest thing for me coming to Stanford was balancing academics and athletics. Whereas again, I had never lifted weights. I had never done many of the things that most of my teammates had coming from more stronger athletic programs and not the sense that my high school wasn't very athletic. We were very good at football. It just it hadn't been a pole vaulting sport before I'd gotten there. Um, and school was really hard. You know, I went to a place that was a public, we only had public schools. I never heard of private schools. You didn't go to summer school unless you failed. That was like a new thing for me. Um, and you know, like we, I had written a 10 page paper for my, that was my senior thesis. And I got to Stanford and within a week, they were like, yeah, we want 20 pages. And I was like, for when? And they're like, you know, in like four days. Um, so Stanford was really hard academically. Um, and I had to work really hard in that sense and then try to balance the sports. And when I got there, I was told by a fr an upperclassman, there are three things you can do at Stanford. You can be social, you can be academic, or you can be athletic and you get two out of the three and I, you get to pick two. And to me, that was all I could do was pick two. So I dated and I had good friends, but when it came to what I wanted to focus on, I focused on my sports and I focused on my academics. And the sport you focused on, again, is not easy. And it was not a very supported sport within Stanford. It wasn't the, the sexy moneymaker like football and basketball or volleyball. So right there, you already had the challenge of making sure the team was intact and the coaches were hard on you. I know that. So how does somebody who's going to school full time and then needing to train 100%, you had no out. It wasn't as if you can say, hall pass, I've got a paper to write due in four days. Your coaches are not looking at you like, 
oh yeah, go ahead, little one, go ahead and uh, finish your paper. It was, who cares? You're, you're here, you're in the track team. I had, um, ever since I've been little, I like set goals and written things down for myself. Um, and to me, my goal coming into high school, so my roommate ended up being my, one of my closest friends and she was one of the top two in the world as a shot putter. Um, and you know, she was like, what is your goal? I'm cross stitching you this pillow. And I told her like, my goal is gonna be four meters 30, which is about 14, 14, one. And at, feet. The, uh, feet. And at the time, jumping 13 feet, when I first got to Stanford in 2000, was enough to get you to the Olympic trials and even to the Olympics. And I had jumped 12, 11 and three quarters in high school, which is just so annoying because it's like literally a centimeter, like this much. Um, and I honest, I had, I had improved about seven inches a year since I had started. And I was like, I'm gonna get to Stanford. I'm going to train year round. I'm gonna have the best coaches. That one centimeter like done in a day, like it'll be easy. It was not easy. Um, I jumped 12, 11, and three quarters for seven years in a row. Seven <laughs> years. Every meet, I would jump between whatever they set the bar up, 12, six, and 12, 11, and three quarters, which is like the most frustrating and annoying thing. So it was enough to keep me competitive at Stanford. Like I was enough to like go to pack, like go to the big meets, but it obviously it wasn't enough to win nationals. Um, and it drove me crazy. I mean, like there are many tears shed over this because I was stronger, I was faster, I should be jumping. And how much of that is mental? And so every, so what I ended up doing and with my roommate is like, I changed all, I've changed now my passwords just so you all know, but <laughs> my password had to do with four meters 30, vault four meters 30, goal four meters 30, clear four meters 40. I typed those words literally dozens and dozens of times every single day. So when I finished Stanford and I had not jumped four meters 30, I found a training center where they're like, fine, they took pity on me. They're like, you can keep training. And I was like, literally guys, I'm just gonna jump that four meters, that one centimeter and I'll be done. But in the back of my head, I was like, I really wanna jump this 430. Um, so where was that, Layla? After Stanford, so after take us to where you, you didn't hit the four meter 30. I graduated Stanford in 2004. I did a master's and stayed an extra year to try to train again for that damn one centimeter. Um, I did a master's in medical anthropology and then I ended up teaching at Stanford for a couple years. And luckily Rose, so the reason I know Rose is that her husband is an amazing track and field coach. And he had been a coach initially when I first got to Stanford um, and then went off and did his own thing, but I kept a hold of him and he willingly and wonderfully started to train me afterwards. And it was, I went from a really negative coaching experience where you know, you are overweight, you're too slow, you're not tall enough, you know, you'll never jump these heights to one with Mike, which is Rose's husband, who was like, you know, well, you know, he obviously didn't say like, you might be a little bit out of shape. He was like, let's just run a little bit more today. You know, like, or like how are we going to achieve these goals? And so that completely changed my perspective and was really good to have that enforcement um, and someone else believe in yourself. And so I just kept, there was a local high school um, where a couple soon like national record, world record holders were training. Um, so they let me jump in with them. And um, after seven years, so two more years after college, at which point I decided like, really this needs to be over. I need to like, come to peace with the fact that I might not jump that one centimeter. Um, at one of the meets, I not only jumped one centimeter higher, I jumped 10 centimeters higher. And so I was like, oh, hey, you know, the only qualifying is only 20 more centimeters and I have five months to do it. <laughs> Maybe I'll go for it. <laughs> Even though when I look back and I'm like, really, it took seven years to do one centimeter. And what were you thinking, thinking that you were going to jump an extra 20 centimeters in like five or six months? Um, but I was interviewing for medical school at the time and going to these interviews and everyone else was like, they're like, what are you doing? And, you know, it's classic med students who scared me, by the way. Absolutely me and they'd be like well you know I just published a paper and I have a patent pending and they'd look at me and like what are you doing and I'm like I'm pole vaulting I play outside with a stick um so it sounded a lot better to be like you know I'm training for the Olympics like it just felt a little bit better and more realistic and I the more I said it the more I was like you know maybe um and just for a little background so my dad's from Tunisia which is a country in North Africa 
My mom is French from Spanish parents and um, I have three citizenships. So I jumped for the US when I was a junior and then when it come to, came to being a um, like nationals, um, I chose Tunisia um, for many reasons, political mainly. Um, my dad's family was very involved in politics at the time or prior. Um, and the US, the way you qualify, so everyone in the Olympics has to make a qualifying mark. At the, and it just so happened that that mark that I had picked like eight years before was four meters 30 to qualify that year. Um, so I had not been typing that in vain. Um, and so I, um, um, the US is you have to be the top three in the country at a specific meet, not only just hit the qualifying mark. And I had seen for the last three Olympic trials that the women who were the top three for the prior four years were never the ones that made it. And I didn't want to bank all of my effort and four years into one meet where the wind or rain, because it was always in Oregon, Eugene, could impact me so that I would not make the bar that I needed to make. Um, so at the end, I ended up choosing Tunisia um, and representing my dad's country, still having to hit the same qualifying marks. Um, and that in and of itself is a really interesting place to be. But um, yeah, in somehow, some way, the very last weekend you can qualify, I already packed all my boxes to move to medical school. Everything was set to go and I cleared the bar and it was an ugly vault. It wasn't pretty. The bar bounced, but it stayed up and it qualified. So that's kind of how I went from that. But seven years is a long time to not improve at all. Seven years is also a long time to keep going after the same one thing that you wake up with and go to sleep with and not say, done. Yeah. Because I'm sure there were people who said to you, come on, Leila, stop now. Or what for? You're going to be a physician. That's the end game. So stop. Yeah. What was the answer you usually gave to them? Or what was the answer you had in your head? Was it different from what you gave them? Um, no, not particularly. I think part of me is that for me, what's really important is the journey. Like the journey, like who I meet along the way, the adventures I've had along the way, like despite the frustrations, like I said, if my closest friends come from this environment, like um, my funnest adventures, my ridiculous times, like that's what's important. Um, and I've really kept that in mind that, you know, like there's not, not every goal that you set out will you miraculously make, but it's like what you do along the way and who you impact. To me, that's what's important. And that's how I viewed my journey. Like even as I was doing it, I was like, you know, this has been great. Like I've done, I've gone to amazing places. I've met amazing people. Even if this is it, like this has been worth it. Like I got to work with Nikkei, like Rose's husband. Like, you know, there's just some other things that I learned along the way that were really important. Um, and so I was okay with it. I mean, I honestly was okay with how things had panned out. And then we get to the Olympics. So yeah. you packed your boxes to go to medical school and then what? You stored them and you packed a suitcase to go to Beijing. Yeah, so my mom moved me in while I flew to Beijing. Totally, I literally was so it's such a last minute thing, getting approval from my medical school and being like, you know, this thing happened. Um, and Beijing was amazing and challenging and wonderful all at the same time. I mean, to reach that goal is crazy in my mind. Still to this day, it's a little bit surreal that I actually did it because again, there are so many reasons why I shouldn't have been there. Um, and, um, dragging my family. My family is hilarious. They're like typical immigrant parents, like, why are you still doing this? One. And two, they were kind of sick of coming to meets. So I'm like, you guys we have to come. It's the Olympics. And they're like, do we really? Like, I mean, it's kind of, we've seen you do it. Like, it's far. <laughs> and like, pulling teeth to get them to come um, was one thing. And then um, Stanford at that time, at that year, sent 80 student athletes. So there was 80 of my friends basically on, in the Olympic Village, which was really cool to be able to see everyone. Um, there were also stark differences on how Olympic villagers are treated, which was shocking to me. So I thought that once you hit the Olympic Village, like that's an equal playing field. Like there are a lot of challenges of being an African athlete. Um, and I can answer questions to that later if we have time. Um, 
but one is resources. So there's a reason that why the entire Nigerian basketball team is comprised of second, third generation Americans, right? Like they don't have the resources. We don't have gyms. We have corruption is more rampant than it is here. You know, we, there was no nutritionist, there's no physical therapist, there's no massage therapist, right? There's just so much that I just assumed that once you got to the Olympics, like that was it. Like everyone has the same resources, same dining, et cetera. And was really surprised to find out that it's a tiered level. So you get to the Olympic village, your country pays for what you get at the village. So we had Tunisia was, is a, had, was at the time very corrupt. It's working on it. It's always been, a, um, it's the, it was the country that was the first to stem off the Arab revolution. If you remember back then, um, and it's considered a success story because they do have a democratic government at this time. But at the time, it was run by a dictator. And so he sent his friends to be the ones that were part of the Olympic team, right? So it was no one who knew anything about sports. And immediately off the ground when I got there, they threatened me. And they were like, if you don't make finals, something will happen. And I was like, really, guys? Like, what's going to happen? Like, come on. Were you really thinking that nothing was going to were you thinking, really, guys? Were you thinking, who are you? I was. I was. I was like, you're being ridiculous. Like, you obviously know nothing about the sport. They're like, we just need you to jump 460. And I was like, that? No, we got 430. That was good. <laughs> like, we're there. Um, you know, and so you get there. We have no shower curtains. We have no towels. We have no TVs. We have no internet. Right? Every country has a package deal. And they pay into that package. So you go to... Uzbekistan was loaded, right? They have internet, they have TVs in every room, like snacks, you know, the US also same, Canada same. But then you get to these tiered countries, you go to Africa, you go to Tibet, you got, you know, these smaller countries, um, Djibouti, for example, and you have none of these things. You don't have sheets on your bed. Like, oh, you didn't bring it? We didn't tell you to bring it? Like, like there's just so many different levels that I didn't realize that even there, that's what was gonna happen. Um, and so that was challenging, I think, being multinational and visiting my friends in the American dorms or visiting other people being like, I really wish I could watch TV. And you know, every athlete's allowed a certain number of tickets, but our government or the people who were there, they took the tickets and went themselves and were giving it out to the athletes, including my coach's pass. So I, they didn't want me to have a coach there because they, they accidentally sold my ticket, you know? So there was just like these little things, you know, I'm like, where do I store my poles? How do I get my poles? They're like, I don't know. I didn't even know like, pole, can you break them down? I'm like, no, you guys, you can't break them down. You know, so it, poles to everyone who doesn't know how long poles are, you're talking 16 feet, 18 feet. Yeah. And you can't break them down. They're not collapsible. Like. You can't shrink them. They're carbon long thing. <laughs> Look at Phoenix. Totally. <laughs> Roll it up. No, you can't. You travel with those darn things. <laughs> yeah, they're very like a big irrigation pipe. So the Olympics had like kind of had that going on, um, but I was still really excited to be there. And the Olympic ceremonies was amazing. Um, and then Ro, I'll kind of talk a little bit, if that's okay, about kind of what happened. Yes, please, please. Um, I uh, had been feeling some belly pain every time I pole vaulted for the last like three or four months. And it was literally every time I pole vault, I would get severe pain to the point where I couldn't crawl off the pit. So I'd run, I'd vault, I'd make it the bar, and then I'd have to like crawl off and lay on the ground for a couple minutes and the pain would go away. And as an athlete, you are used to pain in some sense. You know, you've got aches, you've got strains, you have pulls. Um, and that's just part of the game. And you just take care of yourself and listen to your body and rest when you need to rest. And so I assumed this was it. And I had been training down in San Diego at the Olympic Training Center there. And I had had amazing physicians doing, you know, assessing me and physical therapists doing deep tissue massage and putting their elbow in my belly and being like, you pulled one of your deep ab muscles. This happens to pole vaulters. You're just gonna have to rest for four months. And I was like, guys. Like, I'm really training for this thing. I can't rest. Um, and so come forward to the day of the Olympic ceremony, which was two days before the competition, my last training session, I went to vault. And the pain that normally went away each time I vaulted, you know, and then rested a second, continued um, to the point where I was having trouble walking. 
I was like, this is it. I really hurt myself. And I went to our team physician who was like, you know, same, the same as everyone else. Um, and he wasn't a sports physician. He was just, again, a friend of the president who just happened to be there. And um, I get to the Olympic ceremony, which is amazing and crazy. And you walk out and it's fantastic. And the energy is insane because it's the bird's nest and everything's happening. And there's people literally flying in the air. Uh, and I collapse in the middle. So I, I had my little video camera and I'm laying on the ground and I can't get up because the pain is so bad. And I'm like videoing it being like, guys, this is really fun, but I can't get up. And so I had to be carried out. Um, and I just assumed I had like torn an ab muscle at this point. Um, my pain didn't improve. Two days later, I attempted to compete and I cleared a bar on a very soft pole. So a soft pole is kind of like your practice pole, not like your competition pole, which shoots you really high. Um, but I just needed to, I just wanted to clear one bar to say, I made it to the Olympics guys. I cleared one bar. I was injured. We're good. You know, this was my goal. And that part was awesome because my best friend who had been my college roommate, who had done that little crochet was standing on the other side and she was shot putting, which was really cool. Um, and even cooler was the fact that she had herniated four discs and lost feeling in her leg a month and a half before and had emergency surgery. And so she shouldn't have been there either. So the fact that both of us were there and both of us had reached these ridiculous goals was really amazing and still brings tears to my eyes every time. Um, and then I got done and I was like, and then of course the coaching staff, like, or the Tunisian staff, like doesn't talk to me, like ignores me. I, I didn't, I didn't make finals or jump for 60. Um, but I thought it was great. I still thought it was an amazing experience. And I had to fly home the next day to go back to medical school or to start medical school because I was already a month late. And I get there and I still can't, at this point I can't stand up because it hurts so bad. So I finally go to a doctor and the doctor was like, you're pregnant. And I was like, uh, what? They're like, yeah, you're pregnant. And I was like, I'm sorry. And they're like eight weeks. I was like, I was in China. I'm pretty sure I know how this works. I'm a medical student. I don't remember anything. I was like, I mean, maybe it was the tea. I don't know. Like, I literally don't remember. And I was like, oh, uh, I like had these crazy images in my mind. I was like, oh my God, I'm one of those awkward people on the TV shows. That's like, oh, I don't know how I got pregnant. And then I had a baby. And then I was being like, how do I explain this to my parents? There's a lot that happened in 24 hours of awkwardness. Um, and they're like, well, here's your ultrasound. Go for your eight week ultrasound. And I was literally like, oh my God, this is the worst. Um, not planned, right? Obviously it was not in my mind, um, but I went to the ultrasound and they, and I was like, oh, I'm a medical student. Can you tell me what I'm looking at? And I was like, whoa, what's a giant round thing? I'm like, is that my uterus? So they're like, no, that's a mass. Um, and pretty soon I had a bunch of doctors in the room and I had was having emergency surgery for what was assumed to be cancer. Um, so most people go in for a mass on their ovary when it's about two to three centimeters. Um, cause what happens is like, this is what I do with my patients. This is the uterus. <laughs> These are the tubes. These are the ovaries at the end. And when you have a mass, it twists and it cuts off blood supply. So most people come when it's two to three centimeters cause it's really uncomfortable. So what happened to me is every time I would pull vault, this mass would twist. Um, and at the time it was 13 centimeters across. And, um, that's what everyone was feeling. That was really deep when they were doing deep tissue massage. Um, and that's why, even though I had been like super healthy, I wasn't losing any weight, gaining weight. Um, and that's what was going on. So that was terrifying. Um, and I later, literally in my mind, I was like, great. First of all, I go from being Virgin Mary to like having <laughs> a baby and to like having a tumor. And I was like, this is like what obituaries are written about. Like, you know, makes her dream for the Olympics and med school and then dies. Like I had it all written in my mind. Um, luckily I came out in the surgery and I found if it's one, phys one physician in the state of Montana who would do the surgery, um, with a small incision as opposed to a full incision, because for pole vaulting, you still need your abs. It's the most important part of you. Um, and traditional surgeries would have cut all the way through. Um, so it took a very long time. And then I, um, um, luckily it was a benign tumor. Um, and thankfully it was benign tumor and Four months later, I tried vaulting and I jumped four meters 30 like it was nothing, which is so annoying in so many ways. Um, <laughs> because I felt like I could have done that 
way earlier. But at the same time, you know, had they found that mass, you know, the month before the Olympics, there's no way I would have competed in the Olympics. So there is like a lot of blessing and good luck in all of it. Um, and definitely some interesting memories because of it. So you oh. said something there. You said, so then you had your surgery and then, so I tried vaulting again. It, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't enough to say you went to the Olympics, you were in pain, you had to have surgery for a massive gargantuan grapefruit of a whatever cancer masking. And your first thought was, I'm going to train again because I need to jump. It was so fun at that point. I knew, I knew that I didn't have the hours to dedicate because I was training six hours a day, five to six days a week leading up to medical school. And medical school didn't, you know, I'm in classes eight hours a day. There's not enough hours to account for it. But I love the community and I love the difference in, in the people. I think um, track and field, what's neat about it is every event has its own personality. Um, the sprinters are a personality of force, you know, the distance runners are a different force of throwers. There's something for everyone. And I like that. And I like being surrounded by people who are driven to do better, just to do better, right? Not for an ulterior motive, not for something else. And I think in medicine, um, at least medical students, I found them very off-putting for me. And one of the reasons I didn't go into medicine initially is because they did things often and not everyone, right? This is kind of a generalization, but often they do things to put it on their resume. And I'm doing it because it looks good. And I'm doing it because I want it to sound good. And that has never been my priority. And I've been lucky, right? I'm lucky that I have supportive parents that have allowed me to make those decisions. And I recognize that. I'm very privileged. Um, so I say it's not been an easy journey to get to everything that I've managed to do. Um, but in that sense, like I wanted to be around that community and being the change of going from that community where people are just driven because they have a love of a sport and a love of, you know, beating themselves or, you know, improving themselves to an environment where you, you know, kind of you're, it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's like, I'm going to get a better grade than you. You know, I'm going to hide things like that was just such a strange feeling. And so to be able to continue to pole vault, even though I knew I would never be at that level for a couple of years during medical school, school was just, I don't know, it was welcoming and warming. It kept my sanity. So that kept your sanity. So it wasn't even that it was a goal that just needed to be conquered. It wasn't that top of the mountain that just needed to be reached. It was, as you were saying, it is fun to climb. It's that journey to get you there. And never mind whether it's at the peak or whether it's base height, you just enjoyed it so much that that yeah. was pro what was propelling you and the people that surrounded you, obviously. So yeah. your siblings also, were they like your parents who kept saying, oh gosh, again, or more meats, or were they your champions as well? Uh, my brother is not into sports at all, at all. Um, he's my younger, he's seven years younger, um, and he was actually born at 24 weeks, um, so about four months prematurely, and we didn't think he would do much, um, and thankfully he's an amazing individual. He does have some cerebral palsy, but he's limited in um, that way, and doesn't do many sports, really. I mean, he does some sports, um, but this guy's done amazing. He graduated from Princeton with honors. He has a PhD. He's now an assistant professor. Um, you know, so he's, he's done his own thing, but he was not interested in going to any of these things. Um, my sister, and he studies film too, so all he does is watch movies. Um, my sister is a human rights lawyer. She was the dancer, the singer. We kind of had it, we all fell into our own things. She did distance running, but she understood what it meant to get to these levels. Um, and she, you know, we were like, you guys, to my parents, we really need to go to the Olympics. Like, come on. Like we should go support her for this one, you know? So she was, she was, she understood it. She kind of served as a mediator to, to let them understand what that meant and what it has meant. Um, my parents were, um, are, you know, they had their challenges of moving to a small town where my mom didn't speak the language. English is her fourth language. My dad may be my fifth or sixth, um, but my dad's much more fluent in it because he grew up speaking English. 
um, meant to go to a tiny little town where you know you have no Arabs, you have no people of color, you have um, no other languages, and a predominantly Christian conservative community is challenging. Um, so you know their goal was to assimilate, and they wanted us to do well. Um, so while they pushed us, um, the idea of my mom was just to always do your best. And that was enough for them, which I felt really fortunate. And especially when I got to Stanford and I met other people where that wasn't enough for some of their families. And that would have been incredibly hard um, for us. It was just, you know, find what you're interested in. Ideally, from my dad's perspective, maybe make a little money and support yourself. <laughs> because three kids going to strong schools is a bit painful um, but they were there to make sure that we if we wanted to do it we had avenues to do it um, even if they didn't know they pushed us to figure it out and you used to joke that you are the black sheep of the family you used to throw that around as if oh my gosh if you are the black sheep what would the rest of us be and the reason for that is because of how successful and how as you said your siblings in their own right in their own way they've come to their own and it's extraordinary it's not even it's not even something to scoff at so you saying you are the black sheep we would laugh about that and i would say okay can i just have your pinky or can I have the the thing that they took out of you and then maybe implant that in me because <laughs> my goodness very but, proud so anyways you're I'm very proud of your siblings and even just by osmosis that I can actually even say I know them <laughs> and you of course so okay anyway so through all this were you dating I mean how how was the social life I, I have to squeeze yeah, I, that in there. I know, right? Um, I was dating. Um, I had long-term partners um, who were supportive of what I was doing. They also understood that, like, you know, Saturdays and Sundays, like, I'm at a track meet or I'm training, which is incredibly hard to be in a relationship with someone who's like that, you know, who's like, I'm not going to drink. I mean, I drink some, but I don't drink heavily. I mean, I never did because I was training, and the next day would hurt a lot more, so it wasn't worth it. You know, I'm not going to go out partying I and mean, I did a little bit, but like those weren't priorities in my life and my partners needed to understand that. So I had probably three long-term partners during the course of like the 15 years I was training um, and they were very supportive. It, not all, I mean, it's hard, right? Like it would be nice to not have every weekend built up like that, but you surround yourself with people who are going to support you because if not, you're just not, it's impossible to do as island, right? You need a community. Um, and pole vaulting is a community and track is a community and um, your friends who support you are the ones that kind of see you through it, whether or not you accomplish what you want. But yeah, no, I mean, I have great friends and family and um, partner. Those partners didn't work out. My current husband has uh, never really seen me pole vault, um, but we did go to the track while we were dating, which is fun um, because, you know, you just assume. Did you beat him? Yeah, he assumed, he assumed, we all know where this is going. He assumed he was going to win, um, but he didn't. Um, so now our thing is, is that I don't do pull-ups anymore because that's the one thing I will give him and I'm okay with that, is that he gets pull-ups um, and I'll just get everything else. It's fine. So fast forward, you've dated, you've met the person that you decided he decided the two of you were the union that needed to be happen to be happening. Mm -hmm. He's also a, a physician, as I had mentioned. Now, take us now to the new development and the new challenges of two doctors trying to combine two lifestyles, two schedules. And then you decided you're going to add in a third person and a fourth soon. Yeah. So what does this picture look like? Our life is a bit chaotic. It involves a calendar that's very stringent that I'm sure all of you guys follow in the same way um, to make all of your lives work. Um, ours is a little different in the sense that we work till, like I often work swing shifts, so 6 p.m. to 4 a.m., right? And then he'll start off at 6 a.m. to, you know, 4 p.m. And like we do night shifts. We're constantly changing our hours. Um, so that is 
challenging for two emergency doctors to raise a family, um, to try to find times for ourselves and find times for our family, um, and yet um, still kind of maintain a balance. We, um, we made a decision that I wouldn't, um, my husband is supportive of whatever I want to do, whether it's to continue emergency medicine or not. Um, I love what I do. Um, I love the field that I do. One of the reasons I chose it is because I get to see whoever I want to see. So in the U.S., I don't know if it's I'm assuming it's different in Australia, but in the U.S. anyway, um, you often most people don't have, a lot of people don't have health care or insurances. So the emergency medicine is the only point of contact they have with healthcare physicians, um, for better or worse. So I diagnose really good things and I diagnose really sad things and I see the best of humanity and the worst of humanity. And it's hard. And it's really, really hard. Um, I'm thankful that Brad, I never dated anyone in medicine before him, knows what's going on. And we can talk about like the bad things that happen um, in our job um, to get through them. Um, but I, I chose it because of the flexibility as well. Whereas I knew that if I had my own clinic, if I had a practice, I would be there all the time. And I needed limits and I needed set points. Um, and I also didn't want to deal with insurance. I wanted to be like, you need a CT scan because I think you have cancer. I'm going to get you the CT scan in the next half hour. Not, I'm going to like bill your insurance, think about your insurance, talk to 17 people. Maybe in three months we can do something. Um, and so that being said, we can choose to work as many shifts a month as we want. Um, my husband works full time and I work part time for right now um, because that's the balance that works for us. We will, we've talked about how in the future we can switch, right? When the kids are a little bit older, he'll be part-time and I can work full-time. Um, so it allows us that flexibility. Um, but we do, we work weekends, we work nights, we work all the holidays, you know, so it's, it takes a lot of coordination, um, but we talk about it and we're really good at communicating. And we can always work, everyone can work on communicating more, especially during COVID and ends up you discover, um, you need to communicate. Um, but it's, it's a balance and I'm older now. One of the, you know, I had an amazing journey. I was an archeologist for a while. I did medical anthropology. I worked in Kenya. And one of the things about being a woman and making decisions to bring your career forward and first most for so long in your twenties and thirties is that you face challenges when you start to start a family and we had infertility issues. So we ended up having many miscarriages and going to the IVF route. And luckily our daughter was born um, via that, but it was hard. And it's just a consequence. And that being said, a small asterisk, you know, 50% of it has to do with male. But at this point we had all the genetic tests and it pointed very much to the fact that I was an older 38 year old female trying to have kids, you know, and that is something that I don't think we talk about enough or realistic enough about. Um, and so, you know, having one kid, we tried, you know, several years to have Naya. Um, and we actually were lined up to do IVF this fall when we found out we were pregnant. So that was like a happy COVID surprise. Um, and everything so far. So that's also really good. But it just goes to show that like the decisions you make really impact not just your career, but they impact your family and your future and the things that you don't necessarily think about as you're doing them because you're so driven and focused. And the drive and focus, those two. If there is a picture next to the Webster Dictionary for drive and focus, Layla Ben Youssef's picture would be right there. Because <laughs> it is quite an astounding thing to hear you talk about these things that you've done in your shorter lifespan than some of us. It just blows my mind. But there is one role, my favorite role of yours that you possess is that you're godmother to my twins, who I'm hoping somehow will <laughs> emulate a teeny bit. <laughs> so there are some questions, Leila. But before that, I want to ask you something about your Olympic motto. Sitius altius fortius. Please tell us about that, where that blossomed from. Um, that was when I like started doing kind of the goal setting and I took um, one of my introductions to Stanford class was a class called um, beauty and things and it was about beauty in large spaces so the beauty in a event a space an orchestra or you know to find beauty in different like environments um, and they went over like Lenny Strohal's 
like 1940 something Olympic Games. I don't quite remember. Um, but um, that came, and she was one of the first video operators, a female, and she was also one that did the Olympic Games at that time, um, shortly after World War II. So that was kind of like this inspirational thing, and it came across with the, the motto City of Celsius Fortius, um, which to me just kind of stuck as like a life model. So again, with my combination of like goal four meters 30, there was also Altius versions of it. And my license plate was Altius, which means higher. And it didn't just mean pole vaulting to me. To me, it meant everything that I did. So just to set my goals higher than I thought I could achieve um, to really shoot for the stars, like in everything that I did. And so that's part of it is that, you know, that I hope that we instill in our daughter and our future other one is that, that, you know, no matter what you do, just set your goals high. And like I said, like if you don't often accomplish, there are many goals that I have not accomplished, um, but it's kind of the journey along the way that you find yourself when you're really pushing yourself and making yourself open to new adventures and different paths. And that's how, I don't know, like you find the most interesting things. Like it truly, every decision that I've made that has not been based on career and expectation, but instead has been based on an open door that just has randomly led me, have been the most fun and the most fulfilling. And so that's what I mean when I say Altius, or that's in my mind, that's part of the motto. motto. That's wonderful. May I read you a couple of questions? So first from Laura, did you have a coach championing for you in Montana? Eventually, did you have that? I did. So um, my high school coach, so at first they couldn't find anyone. And then my, my, one of my um, classmates, Luke, his dad volunteered. He was the calculus coach and he had no idea. He just knew Luke, Luke wanted to pole vault. So he grabbed his lawn chair and came after school and a cooler and sat down next to the pit and grabbed a book from the library, which is about bamboo pole vaulting from like the 1960s and was like, sit there with this book and be like, okay, go. And we fell on the ground more times than we fell in the pit, which is absurd because nowadays no one falls on the ground. But there's enough videos out there that, you know, you land on the pit. Um, but that's how he became involved. And now, you know, 25 years later, he's got the most decorated Montana history in the pole vault thing. But at the time, we, he knew nothing, we knew nothing, but he loved it and was entertained by it. And I think the like nerdy side of him was really like intrigued by it. So yeah, he's great. Bamboo pole vaulting. All right. <laughs> Another question. How did the experience of not having access to what are considered necessities during the Olympics impact your performance or focus? And then did this experience inspire you to give back to those countries, to those athletes who do not have what they need to compete at that level, that high level? Uh, yeah, very much so. So yes, I think it colors you because, you know, at the Olympics, what I wanted to be focusing on is my competition. And despite the pain, like I was planning on like jumping well. And instead I was focusing on how do I get my coaching pass reinstated? How do I get my coach in there? Like I, pole vaulting is something you very much need a coach to be there because everything is to the centimeter in the millisecond and you need feedback from them at all times. Um, so I was focusing on these things. I was focusing on like making sure I had a towel you know, take a shower with, like, there was just all these little things. They didn't, they brought me a triple XL, uh, Tunisian, um, competition gear. I can't, I don't wear a triple XL, you know, like, so I had to come up with, and I like ironed on letters that I made my sister bring. Like, there's just like these things that you think that shouldn't be. That being said, you also recognize that a lot of athletes are in your similar situation and going through these things. So when you see someone in the starting line, all you're thinking is like all day, they must've been thinking about like getting on that starting line, you know? But in reality, life is continuing for all of those athletes and like drama is continuing and obstacles are continuing. Um, and those parts of the Olympics, they don't show. And I really wish that they did. Um, and I really wish that I had like some way of being a part of that. Um, but what I have done is I've volunteered coach. So people like Rose husband have given me so much by being volunteer coaches for me because I couldn't afford it. Um, I couldn't afford the training pole vaulting is very expensive as you can imagine. Um, every stick is about $400 and you have about 10 with you at all times. Um, so a lot of people have given so that I could become what I did. 
Um, so I volunteer at all the local high schools that I'm near. Um, but then when I was in Kenya and Ro alluded to earlier of doing a fellowship, um, doing research on HIV and children and measles, I volunteered to be the pole vaulting coach in um, Kenya. So I was the national pole vaulting coach. So as an Tunisian athlete, I went to African championships. And at African championships, I noticed that the other African teams um, didn't have the equipment they needed, had poor equipment, had poor coaching. Um, and pole vaulting can be an incredibly safe sport, but it can be very dangerous if you're not taught the proper mechanics. Um, and there are fatalities associated with it. And so I wanted to make it as safe as possible. So I spent, um, initially it was supposed to be one weekend a month while I was there for a year doing coaching clinics, um, but word spread. And by the end, I had instead of four athletes, I was there every morning before clinic opened at 5.30 a.m. For two and a half hours, I had 50 athletes and I had about 15 hearing impaired from the hearing impaired team. So I was also trying to do sign in uh, Kenyan and Swahili, which is very different than American sign. Um, so it ended up becoming, so that's kind of my way of giving back to the sport, giving back to the community. Um, you know, I think after I have, my kids are a little bit older and I can do more, there's definitely more room to do that. But for right now, I volunteer like twice a week at high schools. Fantastic. Leila, what mental tool would you use when you were under pressure that could help us in our careers as far as, as you said, focus, right, and determination? But what was your main go-to? What was that tool? I think my main go-to is always going back to seeing what, I, what the ultimate goal was or what you get so compounded by different variables coming into you at the end of the day or in the middle of the day or middle of the seconds that you're working on whatever you're working on, then knowing what my outcome, what I wanted my outcome to be, that needed to be my focus at all times because you know, day in, day out, you have challenges, you have injuries, you have obstacles. And if you, don't, if you lose sight of that, which can be very easy to lose sight of, then you get bogged down by what's happening. To me, kind of this resiliency um, was based on like, what do I want? What's the end goal with all of this? You changed your sail. You know, if you were a ship, you changed your sail for every, whatever direction of your goal you were going after. So very much like EAs, we constantly shape shift and we constantly change direction. Do you have any advice if you can relate to the world of being assistants how do you see us having something related to what your life has been that well, we can learn from? Very much like emergency medicine physicians, right? You have, you understand that you have many things going on. You have huge teams um, that you're working with. You have consultants that you're working with, right? You have your hands on, you know, you understand like the larger picture, um, but at the same time you have to deal with like the nitty gritty. Um, and again, like, this is just what I know from Roe and my experience of friends who are in a similar position. So again, I could be wrong, but that's my understanding of what you guys managed to do on a day to day, which is extraordinary. Um, but when, you know, when you're doing all of these things, I think like the big thing is to kind of be the spearheader and to make sure that you're the one who recognizes that's what's going on, even though there are people above you. And similar in my job, there are people above me, there are people below me. I get yelled at on the phone many times a day for unknown reasons. You know, like, why? Why are you yelling at me? You know, like, and, and just knowing that really you're kind of like the puppeteer. You're coordinating all of this and whether or not these people know it, <laughs> you're moving things in directions that you want them to be moved for a certain task, for a certain goal. And this communication is the most important part in my mind, being open with communication, being transparent. Um, and that gives people a sense that you're listening to them. And as soon as those communication doors happen, which are bound to happen, because it's hard to do this job, hard to do what you guys are doing um, with so many people involved and so many personalities. Um, I also call it personality, like managing personality disorders sometimes. Um, that that's yes. everyone's going. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a question here when is your book coming out <laughs> are you planning on writing a book because clearly it's not enough to discuss all the little details and they're all fascinating and gosh just to talk about the emergency room 
stories that you and I have shared. I wish we had time for that because that's totally mastering your mind and body, but we don't. So Phoenix, I'm going to wrap it up with Dr. Ben Youssef. And since she said we're all like emergency physicians, thank you to the other doctors who are in attendance. <laughs> no. <laughs> Phoenix, would you like to say something in closing? It's been amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Ben Youssef. Um, I'm a huge fan because the funny thing is I'm a, I'm a big fat track nerd. Um, I used to run track when I was uh, a lot younger. I was a sprinter, obviously. And <laughs> so, um, but I used to love pole vaulters for a a lot of different reasons, of course, but uh, <laughs> but no, I was just always so fascinated with almost just the geometry and the the physicality and the, the the physics of how the hell. I mean, you've got so many different variables, you know, especially like the bend in the bar and where your hands are located, and you know that that swoop in order to get up. I had a friend that was a, a pole vaulter as well, so he used to try to get me to do it. And I'm like, <laughs> black people don't pole vault, <laughs> so anyway, they do. It's a lie. <laughs> but again, thank you so much for this. This is really fantastic. My whole concept around master your mind was to give people sort of an insight into people that have, you know, had to handle a million different things and but still find that sort of wherewithal to make it happen and to and to succeed and, and in your case excel so thank you again uh for your time and good luck with the little ones i'm so excited for you and uh that's it good nice to meet everyone <laughs> thank thank you nice everybody look. thank you layla all right take care thanks everyone bye bye